Thank you very much, and good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this program here. I have to tell you, our last International Archaeology Day was online. It was with Walter because of COVID. We're not out of it yet. I have a mask. I heard from one of my committee members today that her daughter has COVID and she can't come, but we're almost there. And the world is slowly becoming back to normal. And I can't think of a better way to celebrate that with Greece, because so much of our origins really relate to Greek culture and Greek society. And we'll hear about that more. So I'd like to welcome everyone. Good evening, Your Excellencies, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, Chair of the Archaeology Committee of the National Arts Club, and honored to welcome tonight's audience to an extraordinary presentation by His Excellency Mr. Evangelis Sisakaris, Ambassador Extraordinaire and Penitentiary. Uh, we feel especially privileged that the permanent representative from Greece to the United Nations addresses us on the occasion of International Archaeology Day. The Archaeology Committee extends its sincerest respects to the assorted ambassadors, not all who have arrived yet, but we have coming tonight Armenia, Cyprus, Egypt, Montenegro, Morocco, North Macedonia, as well as the Council General from Greece. Uh, kindly stand, all of you associated with those nations. that to be so shy. <laughs> but you know, it's wonderful that you're here and a very special welcome. We applaud your presence and sincerely commend your diligent efforts and desire for eternal peace. The Archaeology Committee involves dignitaries whenever possible. Once a year, we commemorate International Archaeology Day begun by the Archaeological Institute of America in 2013. It has been our custom to invite an ambassador to the United Nations to present, and they've all been so esteemed. We've been truly privileged. His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Politha T. Cajona from Sri Lanka was our first, followed by His Excellency Ambassador Vladimir Drobnik from Croatia. His Excellency Ambassador Mohammed Idris from Egypt. And online, we had Her Excellency Ambassador Ms. Vanessa Frazier from Malta. They've all participated in the past. Speakers from assorted consulates who discuss rooting and source nations have included Her Excellency Ambassador Kua Sapananu, then Council General from Cyprus, and from the Czech Republic, the Honorable Council Silva Pavlosova, who's now serving in Jordan as the second at the mission there. Advance notice that on October 2nd, the Honorable Michaelis Esfrilius, Council General of the Republic of Cyprus, will be our next International Archaeology Day celebrant, which I trust members of the international community and many in this audience will wish to attend. Before the permanent representative speaks, permit me, as is my custom, some remarks concerning what I deem to be archaeology's contribution. Archaeology as a discipline possesses the potential to enthrall and offers a global complex on complex issues. Its perspective is very unique. Its broad thrust seems ideally suited to demonstrate humankind's shared nature, interlocking heritages, commonalities, and interwoven destiny. The exhilaration connected with excavations and glorious discoveries, which can rewrite intellectual history, 
exerts a mesmerizing spell. To understand the past is to enhance the present and anticipate the future. To understand the past in all its manifold variety is to acknowledge the unity amongst people. To understand the past is to confront life fully, profoundly, joyously. The wish for this happiness to thrive implies that one must pursue peaceful relations. Archaeology concerns not only today into tomorrow, but altering perceptions for an improved future. Our committee wishes to forge a new reality in which freedom can flourish and refuses to validate limitations while acknowledging that although we cannot complete the task, neither are we free to desist from trying. We should devise new modes of thinking to lower the tenor of discourse while not denying facts. Find areas for collaboration. Assert what binds us. Comprehend distances and the right to exist. And never, never lose that yearning for peace. So let us contemplate our interconnections rather than what separates us. Archaeology affirms these laudatory aims. Believing in the ethical responsibility to impart knowledge and exalting disparate traditions, the Archaeology Committee presents a series of lectures which affirm our shared humanity, leading to empathy and respect for others. Our members, united by the palpable love for art, for we have been waylaid by beauty, come from varying circumstances, but are bonded by the belief that if I am only for myself, who am I? To me, the most significant moment occurred, and this may surprise you, when the director of the Turkana Basin Institute posited universal homo sapien ancestry. I recall requesting our audience members to greet the individual in the adjoining seat as a long lost cousin, for we are all family. On December 22nd of last year, Ambassador Sakaris commenced serving as the permanent representative of Greece to the United Nations in New York. His previous distinguished postings, and they truly have been, have included the positions of Deputy Permanent Representative of Greece to NATO in Brussels, Council General of Greece in Istanbul, and Political Counselor at the Permanent Representation of Greece to the European Union, also in Brussels. With sincerest gratitude, it is now my privilege to request that this extraordinary diplomat address our audience. And I thank you so very much. I am honored. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really honored uh, to you, the, I mean, the chair of the Archaeological Committee of the National Arts Club, Ms. Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, for this uh, introduction. I I'm, I'm see the audience having heard so many distinctions in the diplomatic career, as it might be. You might expect uh, an equally interesting and thought-provoking uh, speech. We'll try to do our best. We are very honored to be here, although we are not uh, professionals in archaeology. And I say that uh, in full uh, understanding and respect of the fact that most of the audience tonight are people who know, who have uh, deep knowledge in archaeology. So, I mean, my aim is to try, I mean, uh, uh, you know, not to impress anybody, but at least uh, try to give uh, a picture about the Amphictyonis, which is the theme of uh, tonight's uh, the discourse, Amphictyon a precursor to multilateralism. Multilateralism, we know all what it means, and uh, we are serving in the United Nations. I would say it's the cradle of multilateralism. We have all 193 uh, states of all around the world represented here. But now we invite you, I'm inviting you to do a journey in time. We'll go backwards and see 
when to trace a bit the roots of multilateralism. And you know, we Greeks, we always think that most of the things started in our country. <laughs> Might be true, but not, not everything. It started also to other countries, but still, ancient civilization like ours, but still we will give it a try. So, first of all, the, the earliest evidence of Greek diplomacy can be found in its literature, notably Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, related to the Trojan War. And uh, second, we have to see that the first traces of interstate relations were the Olympic Games in 776 before Christie, and we all remember, most of you might know the Olympic truce, which was actually uh, a truce which was obeyed during the uh, Olympic Games. There were no wars. So this can be also traced. This is something which has to do also with multilateralism. So first of all, we have to define what is this amphictionis means. It's, I mean, uh, it might look like a curious Greek word, and it is to some extent. So, amphictione comes from the Greek word amphictiones, which means dwellers around, from the word amphi, for around, ectina, for community, thus a league of neighbors. An alternate explanation based on legend holds that the amphictione has been founded in the most distant past by amphictione, the mythical king of Thermopylae and then Athens. He was a brother of Helen, the common ancestor of Hor Helens. Hellens and Greeks, it's the same, as you know. So, let's see how, what was exactly the Anaphictione. In ancient Greek, it was an ancient religious association of tribes having as focal point certain temples, as you see here in the, in the picture. Back then, Anaphictione used to be mostly a gathering on specific dates to celebrate festivities in honor of the deity concert. So it has a religious aspect, we might say. Soon these gatherings were transformed in conference-like structures that were responsible for deciding on issues of their operation and security. Back then, religious matters and the need to preserve the sacred sites from war or other threats were considered matters of common interest, just like today's current global challenge, you might say, begging to collective responses. It was, after all, important to avoid by all means the wrath of gods, and this in itself was not something to take lightheartedly, especially in ancient times. We all know what means the wrath of gods at that time. So later on, when uh, we had the establishment of city-states in ancient Greece, the so-called polis in Greek, the Amphictyony evolved as well, and its association of neighboring states formed around the religious center. Initially, the objective was a protection, as we said, of religious sites, as well as the management of their wealth. Soon, though, this association started resembling to a cultural and political union with rules of procedures and permanent structures. Indeed, already in the 8th century BC, the Amphictyonic Leagues maintained interstate assemblies with extraterritorial rights and permanent secretaries. Such associations existed at the cities of Argos, in the island of Delos, and elsewhere. So, I would now want to focus on the most, let's say, known and most important of the Aphictionis, which was the Delphic League in Delphi. In this backdrop, one, as we say, one of the first and definitely the most important Aphictionis was the Aphictionic League, also known as Delphic League. The Delphic League was indeed the Aphictionis where most of the Greek world was being represented. You see, this is uh, the famous oracle of Delphi, uh, that one. It's a very well known. I'm sure mo many of the audiences have visited this uh, marvelous site when the oracle of Pythia, or the Pythia, the, who gave the famous uh, oracles, and uh, we will go, we return to that. Besides, thanks to the prestigious and venerable temple of Apollo at Delphi, exerted an extraordinary cloud. Allow me to remind you that not surprisingly, Delphi was considered the center of their known world at that time. Delphi, the navel of the earth, after all, relates semiologically to the womb in which ideas develop in an embryonic way that lead people in a better ethos. Initially, it was created to protect the temple of Apollo in Delphi and of Demeter in Anthele from enemies. In this respect, the Amphictyony was considered to be 
like other groupings of Greek states that met at a common sanctuary, to deliberately concerning common affairs, as the famous philosopher Strabo put it, Strabon. Yet geopolitics and regional dynamics transform the originally religious organization into a politically important one. With regards to the membership now of the Afectioni, to be sure, the various lists of the original members of the Afectioni found in, in the literary sources are not always consistent as different writers, all of whom were writing after the event, produce their own canonical list. Yet, according to the most sources, the members of this Afectionic League were 12 in number. 12 is a symbolic number. We can find it also in the Afectionis. Mostly for Thessaly, in central Greece, and according to Eschines were the Thessalians, the Boeotians with Thebes as a ruler, the Dorians with Sparta as a ruler, the Ionian with Athens as a ruler, the Perhebians, the Magnets, the Locrians, the Etians, the Theots, the Malians, the Phocians, and the Dolopians who are mentioned in other accounts. Aetolians, Acarnanes, Arcads, Itei, Trifili, and Driopes were also present, although without, without a right to vote. So you can see the, in the pictures the, the geographical locations of these uh, cities. You might say, as is, is the case today with the UN, this was rig there were rigorous rules guiding the representation of city-states, the conduct of negotiations, and the decision-making, if I can use the word. In particular, the conference which, which developed, as we will see, enormous political and religious power was attended by two representatives of each participating parties. There were the Hieromemones and the Pilagores, making in total 25 permanent members elected probably by lot from the 12 tribes of the Afictioni. The Pilagores participated in the discussions of the various requests to be decided upon, just like today in UN resolutions, charged with defending the interests of the cities at the Congress of, of Afictionia. It is no coincidence, of course, that Athens used to send the most competent orators to take part. The Heromnimones were the ones who would proceed with voting upon any matter that was to be decided and looked after more religious aspect. A secretary, a secretariat, a secretary was also elected, assuming a role equi equivalent to that of uh, today's rapporteur. So we see there are a lot of similarities as we developed, uh, I mean, uh, you know, examinations of the, of the Afictioni. Besides the Afictionic church, comprising of, of a four-member representatives, as well as all of those who for any reason were present in the sanctuary at the time it was convened, was also considered an institution all without any significant power. The Afictioni met twice a year, in Delphi in spring, East Pilea, and in Thermopylae in autumn, or in Ipilea. It administered the temporary affairs of the shrines and the properties, supervised the treasury, and conducted the Pythian Games, it would also appoint the clergy and other dignitaries who, by the way, would always be resident of Delphi. To exemplify its power in the, four, in the fourth century, the Delphic League even built the Delphic Temple, as we see in the picture. Gradually, the Amphictionist representatives, having both the judiciary power and following the ancient written laws of Amphiction, started solving disputes and regulating relations between the city-states of the then known world. Indeed, the League doc doc doctrine forbid its member to fight each other and required that no member would be entirely wiped out in war and no water supply of any member would be cut even in wartime. Similarly, it would highly reject the destruction of religious structures in the wartime. So one might say that it was a very efficient system in antiquity and we might, might think a bit if all these uh, things were applied in, today, in today's world, how better it, it, it would have been. <coughs> so the above constitutes, without a doubt, a finest example of nascent international humanitarian law. As Eschines reports, all members were obliged to pledge themselves by an oath not to destroy any city of the Afictions, not cut off the streams in war or peace, and to employ the power and punish those who did so, or those who pillaged the property of the god or injured the temple of Delphi. This powerful council, having religious authority to set the rules for wars, 
have the right to punish the offenders, imposing fines or, or expulsion, or even de 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 declaring sacred wars. Still, as every human structure, it carried with the flaws of human nature and could not effectively prevent the members from fighting about the dominance over the temples. Indeed, the sacred oath in the primitive period of Greek history had a beneficial and civilizing influence, but further on, it inevitably led to more important interferences to the affairs of Greece, and contrary to the spirit of Amphictyony, caused a series of sacred wars. I will enumerate very quickly those wars. The first sacred war started in the neighboring city of Knissa. The second sacred war was caused when the Phocians, a powerful tribe in the league, wanted to become masters of the sanctuary march against Delphi. And the third sacred war, the last, took place in 350 BC, where the Phocians, under Philomelos, captured and sacked the oracle Delphi, causing another war against them, which lasted by 10 years. So you will see all those wars brought somehow uh, the, this golden period to, 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 to an end, might say. By 191 BC, the League had 70 members, with powerful members holding two votes and the others only one. In 31 BC, during the reign of Emperor Augustus and Cleopatra, Nicopolis was another city that was granted membership and indication of considerable expansion. However, the, Amph the Amphictyonic League gradually declined as power, as we said, the rivalry between city-states could not be reconciled with the voting equally of the system of the League. In the 20th century, in the 20th century CE, it was replaced by the Panhellenion, a new unity organization with its seat in Athens, established by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Thus, it seems that the Amphictyony finally faded away, although we have no specific date for its actual cessation. This was a, a rather brief, a succinct effort to present to you a short story and evolution of the Amphictyonis. And I would like to, to draw some conclusions, making also a parallelism with the modern day. I see immediately the UN building here by Yasson. So, as we have witnessed through this journey, the Conference of Amphictyony was evolved in a proper multilateral forum resembling the United Nations with rules of procedures and permanent structures, collective consultations and decisions. The conference was taking decisions on all matters related to the Amphictyony, from the management of the temple, as we say, to the declaration of war against the cities that would not comply with this decision taken. The conference would even determine the cities that should execute its orders, and most importantly, the punishments. Despite its gradual decline due to the prevalence of power politics, its very existence more than 2,000 years ago, constitute the first serious and organized attempt to address difference between tribes and city-state peacefully. In this respect, I would say it would not be an exaggeration to claim that Amphictyony, and especially the most important one, the Delphic League, uh, it was actually the most comprehensive one, was the precursor of multilateral organization, such as the League of Nations after First World War, and after the Second World War, the United Nations that had brought us all here together. If anything, the, dis the decline of the Amphictyony can serve as a wake-up call to honor the principle of the Charter of the United Nations and never cease striving for peace and peaceful resolutions of conflict. As I, as I told you, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm, I, I'm sure that my presentation today is a small part only of this magnificent journey of multilateral cooperation in ancient times. Yet, as this short account of Amphictyony has shown, creating a multilateral institution might take century. Allow it to decline and extinct can only lead to insurmountable unnecessary suffering, endangering, indeed, the very thing that makes us human, our civilization. So, without these uh, brief uh, thoughts, I would like to end my, my small journey into the Amphictyonic world and maybe leave some time for questions. But before that, allow me also to recognize the presence of many of my good colleagues from the United Nations, the, the permanent representative of the uh, Republic of Cyprus, of Armenia, of Morocco, of North Macedonia, of Montenegro, the Consul General, as you mentioned, other friends and colleagues who, who honored uh, us with their presence. Thank you very much for giving this op the unique opportunity to address this esteemed audience. And we are very much looking forward to participate in other events organized by the, by the Archaeology Club of the National Arts. Thank you so much.
was very interesting. I know I learned a lot from it also. Now you are diplomatic. Ah, ah no, the truth. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I think as people, we will have to be diplomatic in life, and we learn from the experts <laughs> and grow from them. Um, I have, I'm going to ask a question, yes. but before I do, I had asked something before that didn't come into pass. I am now asking everyone in this audience associated with the United Nations, with various consulates and missions, will you now kindly stand wherever you are seated? Everyone in this audience is associated. Thank you. Thank you. So, all came up. The numbers are good. The numbers are wonderful. And please, you know, I always like to think of the arts club as a home for discourse and for learning about different societies, different nations. So I hope you'll come here and share, and when you have announcements, we like to be part of it. I must say that. Myself personally and the club as well. I thank you. Let me ask you a question that I was thinking about. And then I'll throw this open. The Olympic Games. Now, what I recall, we had Paul Cartledge speak about it in the days before our programs were recorded. But wasn't when the Olympic Games were held, you had areas that were feuding, but yet they ceased hostility during the time of the Olympic Games. Is that correct? Yes, this is exactly our... Please. Yes, this is exactly what I alluded to, the Olympic truce. Yes. Actually, the Olympic truce was exactly, a, a, let's say, an Can agreement that was forged during the Olympic times that all hostilities would uh, stop. And this is something which was very much observed because, as we say, because all, all of those games in ancient Greece were related also with religion, so it was a very sacred moment, so it was a, a big, let's say, failure or a big uh, insult to start or to continue a war mm -hmm. when these Olympic Games were held. And also to inform the audience, to the audience you might know this, there was, I mean, a movement starting, uh, started in Greece when the, after the Olympic Games were revived, of course, and you remember the Olympic Games started in 1896, and others are continuing till uh, mm -hmm. our times, to have, let's say, the Olympic truce, a modern Olympic truce, mm -hmm. and there was a resolution in the United Nations General Assembly, co-sponsored by many of the member states. It was a Greek initiative, and there is also an Olympic truce center in Athens and in Delphi, mm -hmm. which tries to somehow to revive this spirit of Olympic truce. Of course, it's, it's very difficult. We know that modern times, we have so many conflicts, it's very difficult. I mean, I mean but as I said, imagine how it would be the world when we said during the Olympic Games, let's stop fighting. It's and very find difficult. things that you yes. unite us and I mean, bring us uh, together. I mean, the, the ancient Greeks, I mean, they observed. Maybe it's also, I mean, a challenge for all of us mm -hmm. trying to, to strive for this in modern times as well. This is about the Olympic Games. But a very good question. Thank you. Uh, an interesting answer also. I was just, my husband and I were just in France for a couple of weeks, and it was unbelievable. They're preparing for the Olympic Games now, mm -hmm. cleaning the buildings, and it's one of the ways nations can get together and find commonalities exactly. also. Now, do we have questions from the audience? I'm sure we have many. We'll yes, uh, we ah, have okay. a former board member from the club, please. That's will be a difficult question. Okay, no question. Hi, uh, my name is Guy Fraser, and um, my, my question is more um, about the Olympic, Olympic Games and um, I, I know that you, you talk about the, the Olympic truce, which I, I love the whole premise of the whole thing, and I wish we could go get back to that. But who used to organize them? Was it um, like now, the, the way it's done now, it seems to um, keep having scandals, you know, from... Um, yeah. <laughs> so in, in the past, I'm assuming either it wasn't known or wasn't done, but was it organized by um, like, like one big um, city or country or... or um, and as, since I'm not an archaeologist, I don't know how the correct term I'm using, but was it one um, region that did the organizing 
even though it was always held in the same place or something like that. Thank you. Yeah. No, this is a very interesting question. And uh, yes, actually, these th those games were, were organized in ancient Greece. In the, in the city of Olympia. Eh? That's why they're called Olympic Games. So the site was the same. They were held periodically. I'm not aware if they were every four years or whatever, and it was there. So you remember when the, in modern times, it's the first ceremony when you, I mean, you, you, you lit the Olympic torch, mm -hmm. which is being done in the ancient city of Olympia, which is in Peloponnese, resembling the old times where we have the, the lady priest, the areas which they come, they, they lit the torch, and this torch then, the Olympic torch, goes all around the world to signify that it has to do with all around the world, the, the unity and solidarity, and then it lands to the city which is organizing the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. so, the, so if there were problems in organizing, well, we don't have uh, written uh, accounts, but certainly because the human nature, I assume, is the same even today, even 2,000 years ago, I'm sure there will be problems, but they, they will resolve, I mean. And of course, the, 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 the games, I mean, the sports which were performed were far more lesser than they are today. It was, uh, you know, the more traditional ones. But it's very important, that's why they're called Olympic Games, in the ancient city of Olympia in Peloponnese. So I, I, it, it was not a, uh, that's not a complete answer, but uh, at least a, an attempt. Thank you, but thank you for the question. Yes. Thank you, God. Ye ah, a hand there. there. I have a lot of respect, sir, for the United Nations. Um, I'm a tour guide, so I get a lot of Greeks and others who come here. And being that I'm bilingual, I have a question that's asked every so often. When we go to the Metropolitan Museum, when we go to the United Nations, every so often somebody asks, What's happening with England and the antiquities there? Does the United Nations... Oh, I, second, I want to say something, if I may. I want to brought it up. Um, I have a statement that I gave at a humanitarian a summit at the UN. And I, near the end, I said something about the Parthenon. We, we call it the Parthenon marbles, not the Elgin marbles. Let me say, I was asked the question, the Arts Club is non-political. I'm not allowed to be political. Um, Lord Elgin never got the proper Furman that gave him permission to remove the marbles. He, I remember seeing the photographs, a horrible condition. Well, Lord Elgin was responsible for some of that horrible condition. That was not the way it was. He was told he could take what's on the ground. He went a little higher up. What's happening is an issue for diplomats to handle among themselves. But I can say, as an American, I sincerely hope there's a wonderful museum now if there was an excuse used before, there was no place to bring the statuary, the reliefs, there is now. Uh, but I think it has to be a diplomatic issue between the British government, Greece, members of the British Museum, and I want to make one other comment, and then I'm giving this to you. But this is my opportunity. I feel very strongly about this. Even at the British Museum, at one point, well, they didn't know. They removed the traces of paint. I taught Greek art, um, ancient art, and Italian Renaissance. And a lot of Greek sculpture and Roman sculpture, when they were discovered, they thought they were white. So the Renaissance began with white sculpture, what they thought they were copying, the classical uh, Hellenic ideal. But then the British Museum, after they removed some of the paint, they then painted on top of the marble to try to bring back the original appearance, which they really didn't do. So I feel very strongly, I think the Parthenon marbles belong in Athens. Whatever's going to happen diplomatically, I give this now to a diplomat. <laughs> Uh, you want to compliment the question? Uh, I have to join in. 
Yes, please. 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 Ah, that's very good. Tell us. Okay. Yes, yes, that's what we want. Now. Hi, I'm Edwina Sands, and I'm English and a member of this club and an artist. Anyway, um, well, I was brought up in London to go to the British Museum and see the Elgin marbles and all that. And we thought that Lord Elgin had saved the Elgin marbles from Greece from the hands of the Turks. Now, I don't know everything about everything, naturally, but I'll leave it there. Um, I have to tell you, and for this is a mea culpa. Okay. When I was teaching art history in college, I repeated what my professors told me. And what you said is what I had been taught. And then I learned it wasn't so. It was not the case. But it's what I thought. It's what I'm sure Lord Elgin said when he was before a commission in... Um, before Parliament at one point. But, you know, sometimes we don't go back to the original source and we repeat what we've learned. And we have, this is one of the good things about archeology, span if I may say this. Excuse me, I just want to say something about archeology. span And I learned this, yes, I learned this not from me, it was Brian Rose, but whether he originated it or not, I give him credit, that as archeologists dig down, they destroy layers of civilization underneath. But you have to, but then, they are preserving at the same time and uncovering knowledge. And archaeology really rewrites history. It's down back to the I am. <laughs> okay, no. no. Thank you very much for these questions. This has more to do with diplomacy, so I will try, I will try to give an answer. It's not so well. I, there is. A, no doubt that uh, the British Museum is one of the most prestigious uh, museums of the world. And of course, this issue of the marbles of Parthenon is an old one, and we remember it, uh, it started in the 80s. It was this uh, movement by the very famous and late uh, Greek culture minister, Melina Mercuri, a very famous uh, former actor and politician, and also a, a, a you know, and fighter for resistance during the dark times of the military dictatorship in our country, who started uh, this movement. And um, the easy answer at that time for our British friends wa was that there is no adequate museum in uh, Greece to host them to when they were, were they to be returned. So then, I mean, in Greece, we started the process of uh, building a new modern museum, Acropolis Museum, and it it took us many years, and it's one of the most modern and more uh, I mean, nice museums. I really invite everybody to those who have not yet visited it. So this excuse, because it was, I mean, more, more an excuse, is not any more valid. So now, I mean, the quest, the request to have the marbles returned to their own place, if I think it's valid. There are discussions because it's not a purely government-to-government -government issue. It has to do with the British Museum, which has its independence. That it's a complex issue. It's not an easy one, because it has to do also with this, uh, this start to returning the antiquities from where they came from. Either they were stolen, taken, appropriated. You can use many words. It's a matter of uh, you know interpretation. It's a big. It's a, it's a broader issue, but I think in the case of the Parthenon marbles, it's uh, it's iconic. It's a landmark, and we hope that uh, soon. We hope that we will have, I mean, uh, some positive results. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the main excuse which was uh, presented to us that you do not have an adequate place to put those things, it's not mo more valid. I mean, in the Museum of the Acropolis is, I mean, and they should return there because the Parthenon is, where well, there's a museum, we have the hill, the Parthenon, so it's from where they were extracted, if I could use a diplomatic word. This is, I mean, an... Uh, and an answer, but I think uh, Miss Michelle answered uh, better than myself to this question and more passionate. I'm very passionate about this. Um, I just want to say something which isn't to your question. There was in New York, Alan, you might know exactly when, around 15 years ago, the Onassis Center had an exhibition on the Acropolis Museum. 
and it was wonderful. Fifteen years make sense to you? On when it was? On the new museum? He was on the board of the Onassis Center. The museum opened in 2006. I don't recall. Do you know Burl? I Because I remember going to it. Yeah. Um, the, as I recall, reading the Louvre and the Vatican have given back some of the Parthenon sculpture. But again, as the ambassador says, it's diplomatic, it involves the British Museum. The British Museum did get it in good faith. I think they were presented with false information. That's my point of view. It can be um, a moot point, though. There was another. Yes, who wanted a hand to ask here? something? Yes, yeah. a hand was. was we can go on to another. Yes, we'll give the mic. I've never been here before. Um, I'm kind of wondering the whole issue of repatriation that are often the, what you call the spoils of war. And even in America, they have the Native Americans who are trying to get items that belong to them returned to them. But, you know, the whole idea, of re and I think it's great to repatriate, but I think that also these items educate and bring understanding to people, you know, they go to their local museum and they see these things. Can they create something that they can repatriate but also loan out to countries for people to know about their art? Thank you. This is for you to answer. This is a pure question for archaeologists. Okay. Repatriations. Uh, you should answer. That. Okay. I mean, Forgive me if very diplomatic, and I will try to answer you as best as I can. But let me say also, I discussed this issue in greater depth. Um, legally, if you got the sheet about the programs that we presented, which are online, it's one of the reasons why the online programs are so valuable. And I'm so thankful for Douglas Tilden, um, who gave me money in order to broadcast the programs and educate children. We had a program about a looted object from the Berlin Museum. Um, no, I don't think it was Berlin, excuse me. It, but it was a museum in Germany. And it turned out it was looted, and it rightfully went back to the museum. It was stolen during the Second World War. And in my introduction, I went through some of the legislation beginning with Abraham Lincoln, interestingly. Yeah. Um, in any case, what you say is an issue. It's very important that we educate ourselves. But I think that, it, it, let's take Native American objects. And our first program for the archaeology committee was native sites in New York State. Um, we want to see things, but they can be returned. Some can be loaned. There are so many objects that if we returned objects to the rightful owner, they could still loan a number of them out. That's a different issue than what's been stolen. You know, what is pure and simple looting. I think those are different types mm -hmm. of issues mm -hmm. involved. This is, I mean, kind of, yes. yes. If I, if, I, if, I can yeah. if I can complement to this, your question is very pertinent. Yes, it's, it's a very rightful question. Yeah. Your question is a very rightful one and very pertinent, but I think what Miss Michelle said makes a difference. It's one thing if you find something of, uh, which is a product of an archaeological mission, digging in, archaeologists who try to find, who very smoothly dig, find small objects, they are very happy to bring them back to life. This is one thing. The other thing, it's purely looting, and uh, sorry to say, in the case of the Parthenon marbles, they were not uh, uncovered. I mean, uh, famous Lord Dolkin went there, and he just t tore them apart. He took them, of course, by uh, Firman, which is an act of law of the Ottoman authorities of that time. That doesn't say anything. Doesn't justify this uh, act. So it's a totally different uh, thing. So the other thing is, if you can have this program, which many museums have of lending some very interesting pieces 
which might lead to the repatriation. This is also very important because I think that uh, I might say that the archaeology belongs to all of the world. I mean, the archaeological exhibitions are important for everybody of us. And it's very, I mean, for us Greeks, we are very much, we are very honored and proud to see that there is this big section of ancient Greek uh, sculptures and findings in the, in the Met. Oh, so, so many million of people visit every year and see. And maybe for them it's an inspiration to visit our country as they can go to Egypt and to other places, all these sections. This is a good thing. But the other thing, uh, like Miss Michelle said, which has to do with the marbles of Parthenon and other, if, if there is a product of looting, this is something very difficult. So, and from an ethical and substantive point of view, I think this makes this difference, explains partly your, uh, your reasonable question. Thank you. Yes. And there's also been the uh, UN law that says what was discovered pre-1970, what's discovered afterwards. That makes a difference also in who owns it. Um, we had a program about King Tut. And I'll tell you, I learned from it. I did not know that Carter went into the tomb early and removed some items. And our speaker from France showed objects that were removed. And I remember recently being in the tomb under a year ago. I was there for the opening 100th anniversary from Aussie, the American Research Centers in Egypt. And you can see where Howard Carter literally opened walls to get in. It, it was really quite something. So it's a very important issue. I'm glad you, that you raised it. Now, I saw a hand here. I don't know whose hand. Yes, Was it let's yours? give the mic. Could yes. we pass the mic back? Yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my question is, I was just trying to lighten the mood. You know, I'm Portuguese, so maybe this fall I'll take my girl to Portugal. I know she's going to go next month to Italy. I have yet to be to Greece, so my question was going to be, what is your favorite region? What do you think the nicest region is? And, uh, you know, uh, and then I'm putting you under the pressure a little bit. And then, uh, you know, on a side note, our dog's name is Spartacus. Okay, this is, here we meet. Thank you for the question. Here you might, I might employ some diplomatic skills, but I think, uh, well, it's, <laughs> Well, I would say that, uh, well, our, our country, Greece, has so many places, so it's sometimes it's difficult to choose where to go. So I cannot say you can go to one or to another place. It depends on what we are looking. If there are, I mean, summer vacations and you need a place, let's say, more touristic, with more people, with more, let's say, vivid uh, uh, things to do, there are some islands with our, for, for that. I, I can mention two very iconic, which I'm sure all of, of the audience know, and most of them have visited, Mykonos and Santorini in the central uh, Aegean. We have others, other places, small, more remote for, for more quiet vacation. We have, as you see there, Meteora, which is in central in Thessalia, as we mentioned also in, uh, in the lecture, which is, I mean, a mountainous place which, with the monasteries. So Greece has a combination of summer and winter vacation. And of course, one other place which I will recommend you to visit is in the Peloponnese. You might visit the ancient theater of Epidaurus, which we have also now the, the institution. You have ancient Greek dramas being performed in the ancient theater. And when you are going to Epidaurus, you can pass from the city of Nafplion, which was the first capital of Greece, a very nice city, which happens to be my hometown. So this I give you. As, so, but it's a very nice uh, city. Thank you for the question. It's an honor for us because we come from Portugal, an equally beautiful country, Mediterranean country, a country which have very close relations, and a country that has also the Secretary General of the UN. If you're more wrong, Mr. Guterres. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for opening our eyes to really an intellectual concept that has led directly to the United Nations and how one can form peaceful relations and areas protecting shrines and people, which is important. 